Sheena, thank you so much for being on the show today. I've really been looking forward to talking to you about your life and work. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be on here today with you. Oh, so you guys, I saw Gina's work when she applied to be a studio visit artist and she will be a studio visit artist. And I, I, I went to her website. I learned more about what she's making and I knew I had to have you on the podcast because your work is incredible. I can't stop looking at it. It is so beautifully crafted. It, the, the shadows, everything that it's doing, I just, I want to keep looking and I want to really experience it in person. Um, so one of the things I love to do when we first meet is to ask you a little bit about your background and how you first came to the arts. Well, I want to tell you, it's a very long, windy road and I will try my best to condense it. Um, first of all, I am an only child, I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, so I think that had a lot to do with my my journey. Um, I went to high school. I got really into home economics at that time when they used to have it. Um, so I really like sewing a lot. And I, at that time, I was going to go to art school and become an artist. But then I thought to myself, like, well, how am I going to support myself? So I decided to go to school to be a fashion designer. So I graduated high school at 16. I attended college and got my associate in two years. So when I graduated a college, I was 18 and I had my fashion design degree and I had my own little business for a little bit for maybe about three or four years. I traveled throughout the Midwest trying to sell my, my clothing. And, you know, at that time I was very young, naive, and a lot of people kind of cheated me out of money and I got really upset and I decided to go into the military. Um, people probably ask me, why did I do that? Well, my dad was a Korean vet mm -hmm. and I sort of kind of did it because I'm a girl and there's no boy. So I sort of did it to my dad's honor. Mm -hmm. So I went in, in the reserves, but during, and a lot of people don't understand what the reserves are. The reserves is when you go one week in a month and you go two weeks a year for your active duty. So we're called the weekend warrior. So I did that and uh, my dad wasn't very happy with it. I was 22 when I went in, but long story short, um, during that time when I was in the military, I did go got, I did get my BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I originally it was a painter because um, when I was a child, my mom tried putting me in all kinds of different kind of uh, classes, uh, acrobats, ice skating, piano, and I got kicked out of all of them. <laughs> and, <laughs> until I found a friend who who I had a friend at that time and she was taking art classes and I got really excited about it so I asked my mom if I could take it and my mom said well we'll try one class and I went I loved it I was in a in a class with kids of my age and I went home and I told my mom mom I need to get out of this class because I need to be in an adult class because I can't handle because I was only nine and my mom said why I said I can't concentrate so we talked to the teacher and the teacher said, okay, we'll put you in adult class. So I was there for several years and I loved it. And I won several awards. And then, uh, so that I was a painter drawer. So when I went to school at Art Institute, I went in doing that, but I also experimented, you know, I did, uh, some wood, woodworking, some metal work, a lot of paper making, a lot of photography. So I was just experimenting with different mediums. And then during that time, 9-11 uh, happened. I remember walking down the street of Chicago and I heard people, saw people running and I'm like, what's going on? Because I thought something happened, you know, and obviously something did happen. And then I discovered that 9-11 happened. The Twin Towers were coming down and I was like, oh crap, that's it. I ain't going to lose a year of school. So at, during that time, I was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I went in the Navy. During that time, I was in the Air Force. I was a military police and I figure, okay, well, that's it. So I was going to guard something. So long story short, we were supposed to go to Kuwait. Luckily, we never made a Kuwait. I landed up in a, sitting in a box in Wisconsin guarding grass. <laughs> For 12 hours, I sat down a hallway guarding picture frames um, in the middle of the night. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what am I doing with my life? And I was doing a lot of re reflection of my life. 
And I remember my mom was telling me, you know, several times, Gina, why don't you become a teacher? And I said, well, I don't even want kids. Why would I want to be around a bunch of kids? Yeah. So I thought about it long and hard and I'm like, well, okay, well, maybe once I'm done with this, you know, deployment, I will go ahead and, you know, go back to the school of art institute and major more in art ed. So fast forward, everything finished. I went back, did that. And then I uh, got my degree and I was looking for a job in Chicago for be a teacher. Couldn't find anything. And I always had this beautiful dream of moving to California and being next to palm trees and the ocean. And, um, you know, and I got, I went to this art, I mean, this job fair in Northeastern and there was three districts that was from California. So I applied all three and Kern uh, high school district was the first to call me and say, Hey, you know, we want to interview you. And I'm like, okay, but I need to come out there. So they paid for my hotel. I flew out there, flew to LAX, got in a car, drove up the grapevine. And I went down and I'm like, Oh my God, there's nothing here. It's flat. <laughs> <laughs> and there were some mountains around and I'm like, okay. So I went there, got interviewed and I like what the, the principal was talking about. So the next day during a field trip with some other teachers taking some bunch of kids to, um, you know, grizzly mountains or something like that. I said, okay, I'm going to get the job. And I remember being out here for about a year and I'm like, was very homesick because I it was culture shock. I mean, it was like not, and there's not really much here. Um, not very, a lot of, not a lot of ethnic foods and not a lot of culture, and I said, you know what? I think I am going to move back. And my mom said, well, Gina, give it time, give it time. And so toward the end of the year, one, one girl told me, Miss Herrera, I need to go talk to you outside. I said, okay. And she kind of, her name was Jenny. She, she was kind of acting a little weird. Like I like, cause at that time I had a door with a window and she was, you know, looking in the window and I'm like, why does she keep looking in the window? But anyways, so we went inside and all the kids start clapping. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. It's not my birthday. I don't know what's going on. And they gave me a plaque saying that I was the best teacher. Oh. So I believe in spiritual intervention. I believe that that was my sign. And that's what they gave me. And I've been there for 19 years. And uh. so, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's part of the story so you can ask me a question because i could keep going and going <laughs> oh i love it i wonder does does jenny know that she like really changed your direction of your life a little bit there i wish she knew i don't know i don't know um if she's on instagram or not i don't know yeah. i mean i hope yeah. she does hear this and know that her, she did make that path for me Wow. Isn't that amazing how people come into your life and just can change the direction? Like you said, you know, spiritual intervention, like here's the path. Come on, come on, Gina, go this way. Um, and it sounds like it has just worked out phenomenally for you. Uh, I love the story of different things that have been wove together to create who you are now, you know, from the fashion design, from the military, from everything that happened after 9-11 to being in California. I feel like these different experiences come together to create the type of work that we make, right? Like it, it kind of feeds out of us. Um, so I would love to go to right now and and what you're doing and what you're working on. You have these incredible sculptures that you create. Um, so can you tell us right now, like what is a day like for you or what is it like in the studio for you? Well, um, you know, I, I try to get in the studio as much as I can. As, as I've mentioned before, I am a full-time high school teacher and a college professor twice, twice a week. Busy. So busy. <laughs> I'm a very busy person. Um, so Sometimes I do take my work to school. Um, and so my kids are working on their project and I take it to school. And I like to do that because sometimes I want my kids to question, like, what are you doing? What are you making? Like yesterday I was covering this uh, sculptural, uh, sculptural piece that I'm working on right now. And a lot of kids are, what is that? Is that a cow's head? Um, what are you covering? What what are you using? And, and I like that because I want them to be curious. I want them to be be like a child, you know, like, you know, wondering like what she's doing. I want to know. I want to go over there. I want to touch. 
and things like that. And and a lot of times it's very interesting to hear that perspective, like what they see and what they, I mean, sometimes they give me some good advice and things like that. And so sometimes I do take my work to school. Um, and I like last night at college, I did take part of my sculpture and I was, you know, working because I don't know, I kind of it's like, it's interesting dynamics, you know, the kids are working. I don't want to just be sitting there on my computer. I mean, I want to engage, you know, cause sometimes when you're working with other artists, it kind of like, it has a different momentum and things like that. And so I do that. But then mostly Tuesday, Thursday nights are my nights where I come in the studio and I work. And then on the weekends is when I go outside and I weld or I plasma cut, which I have right here. Um, and then what I do is I build my armatures mm -hmm. and I bring these steel armatures and then I bring it indoor. This is my indoor space. And then I go ahead and I bulk it up, you know, like over here, you know, I added a bunch of things to make it wider because it was basically a rod. And then that's when I do my inside work. So I have an outside work and then I have an inside work. So, um, but then also too, you know, where I live and during the summer, it's really hot. I mean, we're talking 110 degrees and I have to be outside. So sometimes, you know, I have to take it in moderation or I have to get up really early. So it's really, I got to go with the weather and the timing. And then during the summer, that's when I do a lot of my art and breakthroughs. I go to workshops, I go to residencies because by the time May 31st come, I am burnt out. My brain is tired. I can't, I can't give because, you know, teaching is a very giving, giving, giving um, profession. And I have to intake. I have to, it's like my, my tank is empty. And yeah. so when I go during the summer, that's when I try, I apply to residencies, I go to workshops. Um, and that's when I try to push myself to another level, learn a new craft, a new technique. Um, so that when I come back, I feel refreshed and I feel like, wow, I'm like, wow, I learned this. So now I can apply this into my studio and things like that. So I love how you're mentioning this rhythm that you've created for yourself uh, in terms of just working inside and outside, but also with um, the year. And before we jumped on here, you know, we were talking a little bit about nature and the outdoors. So I love, again, that this idea of the cycle of a year really starts to come in the cycle of a day, even uh, really impacts your work and therefore becomes part of it. You know, even if your work isn't about the environment or something like that, it still feels like it's part of it because of that rhythm that you've cultivated. Um, that brings me to another question I have for you, uh, which is you're talking about you, you welding a lot of your pieces, plasma cutting, then you're building the base. Um, do you start with sketches for a piece or do you have like materials and you're like, I want to use these materials to do X, Y, and Z. How do you really start um, a piece of yours and work on it? Well, that's a very good question. And I really like the cycles because I never really thought about that. You know, it's like seasonal. I don't know. It's something I'll have to think about. Um, very good observation. <laughs> um, as far as my work, um, I'm, I go back to being a child. Um, I go back to when I was a little girl and I would have stuffed animals, which I still do. I have a lot of stuffed animals. I'm still a child. <laughs> um, and I make voices with my stuffed animals. And I remember when I was a kid, I would have a cash register because I was an entrepreneur. You know, I had a grocery store and I lined up all my stuffed animals and all my stuffed animals would come and purchase items. So I sort of like do the same thing. I play. Mm -hmm. I don't sometimes in the middle of the night, I have epiphany, you know, something comes to my mind, like, oh, I could do this and this. So then I'll sketch it down. So it's something that I put down so I don't forget. But I really don't sketch my work. It just comes to me. I, I go outside and I, I have a lot of things and I put it on the work table. I put it on the floor and I, put it together. And then I'm like, nah, I don't like it. It's kind of like playing Legos. I put this and this and this. Sometimes I hate it, tell my husband, my husband, Hey, can you come over here? Hold this. I want to look at it, you know? Um, and I have things in my studio where I have toys, I have rubber tires, I have things categorized. And then I try to think about what am I going to put together? Um, so I don't really, I'm very intuitive. I just, 
put things together. I mean, like my plasma cutting here, I just take a piece of metal and I hand draw it with a with a chalk and I just take the plasma cutter and I zzz, and that's it. And that's all I do. And they always come out to be organic forms. A lot of people have said it looks um, like map, like a map like. So I don't know, maybe in my back of my mind, you know, maybe during my travels, um, maybe my expeditions in nature and being out in nature, um, a lot of things come out like as people, as animals. Um, so yeah, I just, I just sort of just put it together. And there's times when I make a sculpture and I put something on it and I have it inside and I look at it. Oh, I don't, I don't feel it. I don't, I don't, I'm not feeling it. So I, I go out, you know, to the garage every day and I look at like, mm, no. So I, sometimes I do it for a week or so. And I keep looking like, Oh, I hate this. It does not going together. So then I go out and I go in my shed and I rummage like a mouse looking for new cheese. And then I put it on and I'm like, maybe. And then I play around and things like that. So sometimes some things take me a little while. Some things just come really naturally. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is when I have a preconceived idea in my head and I'm really set in making it, it never works. Yep. I tried that over in the, you know, at Anderson Ranch this uh, past summer. And I told Trey, Trey Hill, I'm giving a shout out to him. Um, that I had this clay idea and he, and then he, he knows me already. And then he told me, he said, Gina, let's just make a leg. Okay. <laughs> he was like, he told me that he said, don't stress about it. Let's just make a leg. I'm going to help you make a leg. We're going to get it. Okay. And I don't know what happened. Something triggered. And when I saw my leg coming together and I'm like, Oh, and I went on crazy. I start creating. I was like a night owl making all these clay things and all that. And I'm like, okay. So I just had him to just reprogram me for a moment and things like that. So, uh, so I yeah. That though, Like pushing yourself, you know what I mean? Like you're intuitively making, and then you kind of can catch on to one thing and then dive into it. And, you know, something that I keep thinking about as I'm looking at your work, I have a few questions about it because I find it just really fascinating and beautiful, um, is this idea of light. Like, you know, these, you have these lines, like you mentioned, people have said they look a little bit like maps, like these winding lines that are happening. And the way that you photograph them and even just seeing them behind you, the light is so important in them. I mean, it just reformats the space around it. So when you're working on them, is that something that you're kind of thinking about or is that after it's done and you're kind of a, placing them in a space? Do you think about it? I'm just interested in the idea of like lights and shadows and, and, and your thoughts on that. You know, that's that's been something that's always been in my work since grad school. Mm -hmm. um, everybody used to always mention, man, your shadows, they're, they're an important component in your work. And I, I am playing around with those ideas, um, silhouettes. Um, I've been working on, I have a friend, Cassie, um, she works with me. She, I asked her because she's in graphic design and I'm like, I don't know anything about computers. So she did like silhouettes of my work and I'm trying to figure out ways of translating my, my 3d work into two dimensional work, because, you know, I'm being, I'm going to be doing a couple solo shows. Um, some of them are distance, long distance. And so anyways, so that's sort of like the shadow of my work. And I don't know, I've, I've always, they, they look so much different. Like my husband always tells me when I take my sculpture out of this space and put it in a gallery, he said, this is where it belongs. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is where the, the lighting, you know, it, it takes, it takes, it has its own spirit of its own, you know, when it's there, it's like, you know, it's like the strong warrior or things like that. And yeah, I've been really, you know, especially like when my plasma cutting, you know, because that really has a lot more depth when there's light, different lighting hitting it from different angles. And so, yeah, I've been really thinking a lot about that. I don't think about it when I'm making it. I just make it and somehow it magically comes together. Um, so, yeah, I just, but I've been really thinking about the shadows and 
how how important it is you know it makes a different depth to my work yeah yeah exactly more depth it makes it take up more space it's just so beautiful seeing that i mean the sculpture itself is gorgeous but then how it impacts what's around it it's just so effective that way and that brings me to my my other questions and i keep looking of course at that piece that's right behind you that has like the jeans on it a little frill um i am so interested you know you you went to college very young and you studied fashion design and I, i'm also looking at your beautiful jacket i'm jealous of your jacket i keep looking <laughs> at the bird i'm like that is amazing you know um how do you feel like uh fashion design or fashion impacts your work if at all you know i do think it does um i think it it does subconsciously because you know, I think about environmental damage when we're, when I'm making my work. Um, I, th this all, I've always loved nature since I was a child. And I always felt that I was always different. I never fit in anywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a child, I was five years old, I would walk my dog. And when I looked at trees in an urban area, I felt I was home. And I just think that I've always been different. And as far as with the fashion design, um, I when I went to fashion school, I never really thought about these things until when I was in Iraq. And there was this, I discovered this on my own. I was in a truck and I was just driving around this humongous base, which you know was like desert. There was nothing, no trees, no birds, no animals. It was just sand. And somehow I came upon this place where I call it the graveyard. I don't know. Technically, that's not the name, but to me it is. And it's military trash. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of trash that we left behind. Mm -hmm. And me standing there wearing my military uniform, I'm like, wow, we are the culprits. Mm -hmm. And it's not just only in military trash. It's also about fashion, fast fashion, H&M, Forever 21, Cena, all these places where they make things, you know, for a couple of dollars. So it's, it's throwaway fashion. And I think about, you know, one time when I was giving clothes away to Goodwill and I'm like, well, I am doing a good cause, but then I'm thinking, well, I'm just adding to the amount of stuff that we put in shipping containers and we ship to a third world country and let the third world country deal with our trash. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why I started to incorporate more of my own clothes and my husband, my mom, my dad's clothes into my work. And but then I also do a lot of wrapping. Um, so what I do is I cut up materials and I try to use discarded things, you know, toys like there's a little hand up there. Um, there's like a hose, you know, things that we throw out, you know, um, that I feel guilty because I'm just adding more environmental damage um but yeah i mean like these ones i know you can't really see but if you go on my website i mean they, they're kind of like a fashion model um mm -hmm. i have two pieces that i made to chicago and you know one is this is called the virtuous warrior so this is like the utilitarian side of me and then the whimsical diva is more of the playful side because there's a little rubber ducky in a hammock you know swinging around um, but yeah, I, I think fashion does have something. I mean, I always kind of thought about, you know, I, I always admire people that upcycle, you know, use like I, I bought these pair of dungarees, uh, old BDU pants that this girl put patches on. So I'm thinking, well, maybe that's something I might want to do eventually. I want to like do some maybe jewelry. Um, so I'm thinking that maybe eventually I might maybe make a, like a mini line of things um, because I, I really do enjoy that thing. I love sewing sewing is very meditative just like rapping is very meditative to me it kind of calms me down and makes me zone out I love that and what you know this is something I noticed about your work too and why I really wanted to have you on the show is I feel like a lot of artists try to repurpose materials and sometimes it's not as effective as it could be but I feel like you really transform Form the materials that you use and make it into an art piece, you know, and that's a difficult thing to do because a lot of times, you know, you'll see something where it's, they're, they're repurposing materials and it's like, well, that feels like a spoon and that feels like a, this, these come together and feel like an entire piece instead of 
pieces that have been placed together. It's so incredibly effective. Um, and that kind of brings me to this other question that I wanted to ask. And I think you may have started to discuss it a little bit, but I want to know if your experience being in the military has impacted the work as well. I mean, because that's a pretty, like you've, you've put together so many different life experiences and this is an experience that not everybody has. Um, and it's very specific in some ways. Do you feel like that has impacted your work? Yes, I would say it has, um, you know, it gives me a lot of discipline. Mm. Uh, it gives me a lot of resilience. Even though when I do get rejections, um, there are times I do cry because it's like, you know, when you are putting your work out in the world, it's like you're basically taking your heart out mm -hmm. and putting out there and say, okay, are you going to accept my heart or are you going to pound and smush it? Mm -hmm. um, it gives me a lot of focus. Um, I am a very different type of artist, um, you know, cause I can even, I can even compare myself to other people in grad school. Um, I was always there. I was the first to be there and I was always, I was the last to leave. Mm -hmm. I was very disciplined. I was very focused. And even to this day, I am, even when I go to a workshop, even if I go to a residency, I'm very focused. Um, I, I go there and I have a mission to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm there to learn and to, to absorb, to get as much as I can. And I think also to being in a predominantly ma male world, you know, um, and being a woman, uh, is very different. Same thing with welding. Plasma cutting is a very male dominant. I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, it started translating, you know, cause I remember, Several years ago, my mom always kept saying, Gina, you need to do more metal. You got to do metal. You got to do. And I'm like, mom, I'm not ready because I was kind of like I had to get over my my fears mm -hmm. of using these powerful tools that could literally burn you or cut you and things like that. And I wasn't feeling it. It was like it's like I'm always going with my intuition, like I'm not feeling. But now, you know, I I mean, I'm not a perfect welder. I still want to really learn how to weld really well. But plasma cutting is my jam. I love plasma cutting. I mean, because it's like you're just using this hot torch, um, this hot, you know, tool, and you're just drawing. You're just like free drawing and stuff like that. And so I think that's sort of like my male side, you know, and mm -hmm. wrapping and doing all the color thing is more my female side. So it's kind of like this interesting dichotomy of male and female and, you know, like being in the military, you know, you wear a uniform, everybody looks the same, your hair has to be a certain way. And, you know, you have to conform to a certain parameter, like this certain box and things like that. So sometimes I'll go in that little box, but then there's times where I'll get outside of my box and I'm like, oh, I'm going to be this crazy, this crazy kid and just have fun and things like that. So, but I think the military really helped me to discipline myself, yeah. to be driven, to be, I've always been driven. It's sort of like when I was 16, 18, I was really driven because I, I have these old VHS tapes and I saw myself on, I was on a TV at that time. Um, and I saw myself, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so young and so <laughs> vulnerable. I'm like, oh, and I cried my eyes out because it's like, it's so weird to see yourself when you're so young but it's like, it's almost like, it's like I went a full circle. Like mm -hmm. I'm that young, I am that young girl, but in a more matured, more focused body that, but I'm very driven. So it's like, like I went in this empty, like I went in this circle and circle of finding myself, like a dog chasing its tail, mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. myself, what I'm going to be. Because I remember sitting in that, that t a chair, staring at the walls. And I was drawing and thinking to myself, I mean, what purpose do I have in this world? I mean, what, how are people going to remember me when I die? Mm -hmm. And that's really when I start to really think about like, what is my mission? What is, what am I, why was I put on this earth for? And I think teaching is part of it because I feel that I've affected many lives and I still have students that, you know, 
you know, text me when I post some, oh, Ms. Herrera, I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you. You know, I'm so glad you were my teacher. You know, and there's other kids that can't stand me, but that's okay. You know, that's just the way the world is, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I think that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's prepared me for something bigger. Yeah. Um, for me to handle, to kind of brush off things when people start saying things about me and to toughen me up and things yeah. like that because you you have to be a soldier in in the in the art world <laughs> yeah it's like what we were talking about before is having grit like there really is something about that um to be an artist because you have to have a vision and you have to believe in that vision and a lot of people are going to say oh that's stupid or why are you doing that or you should do it this way you mm -hmm. know and and that's not bad. Uh, people have opinions. People can say what they like, but you have to stick to what your belief is. And it takes a lot. It takes a lot. So I love this idea of discipline and being able to be in the studio, um, to be able to handle that criticism or just handle people's comments. You know, like you've got to, if we take in everybody else's opinion, we would never be able to create, you know, my big thing over the past couple of years and working with artists is this idea of trusting the work. Like you have to trust your work because if you do not trust yourself in your work, you just can't move forward, you know, um, because it's going to keep kind of going off to the side and you're never going to fully get to this um, apex of sorts of where you feel like you're truly being yourself in your work. So I, I really like that idea of, um, I'm just having that drive and knowing, okay, one foot in front of the other, got to keep going. I think that's, that's really beautiful. Um, I would love to hear from you and I, I'm excited to hear your response because you have taught many artists and many people and you have these wonderful life experiences of advice that you've received or that you've learned yourself that you like to share with others that you could give to the artists listening to the show right now? What I would say is be you. Mm -hmm. Don't be trying to be somebody else. Um, because, you know, one thing that I've, I've always created in my studios, I don't want my work to look like somebody else's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very driven about that. I mean, I do look at a lot of artists, a lot of people, there's a lot of talented people out there um, and things like that. And I really try my best to have my own style, my own signature line, sort of like being a fashion designer. Um, you know, it's the same thing, you know, it's fashion and art is the same, you know, you don't want to be look like the next Calvin Klein. Okay. Because Calvin Klein's been there, you know, you, you don't want to be Issey Miyake, which, you know, he was a great designer, but you don't want to be that you want to be your own self. You want to be true to yourself. And I always say, experiment, mm -hmm. go out there, try new things. Even if you're afraid, just try it. If you don't like it, then don't do it again. You know, I mean, because I think the thing is, I think a lot of times, a lot of artists get stuck doing one thing and that's all they do. You know, I want to go back to painting. I, I do, because I am a painter. I've been a painter ever since I was a child. But that's one thing that's a challenge for me because I don't know what am I going to paint? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, that's, that's the thing. I have to figure out that. So maybe through my sculpture, eventually I'm going to return to that and maybe do an extension of my art that way. Um, but I think the one thing I've, I've gotten an advice is create a problem mm -hmm. in your studio and yes. overcome that problem, create a challenge and overcome that challenge. Um, sort of like right now, I'm, you know, I haven't done clay since summer but that's something that I want to do. I really want to keep pushing that. I want to do glass. I want to cast my body parts in glass. I want to push, I want to push the envelope because I really want to see how far can I go so that eventually my work can go outdoors, mm -hmm. um, but still kind of create, still carry that recycle idea. You know, it's a little harder, you know, when you get out in the outdoors because the elements tears apart a lot of materials and go to residencies, go to workshops, 
go be a student. You're you, you as an artist, no matter you think you know everything, we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. We are always students. And I'm always craving to pick other people's minds. You know, like somebody who has mastered something, I want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. How do you do? And I, I'm, I'm one of those students that I ask a lot of questions and I probably drive all my teachers <laughs> crazy because, Hey, I'm paying you money. I want to get my money's worth, you know? And so I like to ask a lot of questions and just be true to yourself. You have to be true to yourself. You have to be you. Cause really that's in the end, when you die, that's all you are is yourself, your mind, your soul, and what's in your heart. Um, because that's the problem with today's world. I think people want to be like the influencer. They want to be this. They want to be popular. They want to be, you know, everybody has their hair a certain way. I don't care about any of that. I am who I am. And have I been picked on all my life? Yes, I have. Are there people that like me? Yes. Are there people that can't stand me? Yes. But I don't care. I am who I am. You know, if you really want to get to know me, then make the time and I will give you the best of me. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't want to be fitting in. Mm -hmm. I want to be known for my work. I don't really want to be known because I know A, Y, Z. I want my work to stand out. And when people are like, wow, who is that? I want to get to know her. And, and that's the thing is, you know, and I know the art world is very clicky too. It's a very clickly clicky, networky, but I believe in the universe and I believe that, you know, what's going to come is going to come. And, you know, and I know my dad is helping me a lot. My dad is upstairs, you know, he's, he died four years ago. And I noticed that after my dad passed away, a lot of things have been coming. And I know my dad's working overtime. So I tell him, Hey dad, whisper in that person's ear, you know, or, you know, knock on their door or something, you know, but I don't know. I just believe you got to believe there's a higher power. You got to believe that there's something higher and that, you know, you do have some control of your destiny, but then there's some things that are out of your hand. And another thing that I've learned that if we want something so bad, it's not going to happen when we want it. It's when the yeah. universe wants it. Yeah. I truly yeah. believe that it's all about timing, 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 timing. And do I have my creative ruts? Oh my God, I have a lot of them. And you just got to get through it. You got to plug through it and you just got to find some little tiny match and ignite that little fire that's still there to explode it again yes. and get excited again. Yes, I love all of that and agree with all of it, you know? And it's funny because you were saying you want to be known for your work and I saw your work, you know, I didn't get to meet you first. I got to see your work and I was like, I've got to talk to this person because this work is phenomenal and it's so interesting. And I completely agree too with timing, the universe, something bigger out there, 100%. Uh, Gina, this has been a blast. I have really enjoyed our time together, learning more about you, about your work, um, being inspired by you too. Like you had me thinking, I was like envisioning sculptures in my mind um, that I want to create, you know, through this conversation. So thank you so much for being here and taking the time out of your day. Well, I am I am very happy about this and I feel destiny. This was our destiny to meet. Yep. And I hope one day I will meet you in person and things like that. And I really, truly enjoyed this conversation. And I hope that I can help young artists to believe in themselves, that it's, it's going to be a hard journey. But if you believe in yourself and believe in your work, it will come into fruit. It will become something one day. Yes, 100%. Gina, can you tell us where we can find you online? Of course, we'll be sharing your work over on our website and our social media, but where can people find you? Well, my Instagram handle is Gina, G-I-N-A-H-E-R-R-E-R-A-A-R-T. -R -R -E -R -A -A so Gina Herrera Art. Um, and then also my website, uh, www.ginaherrera.com. And yes, I would love, uh, you know, if anybody hear my podcast. And if you want to reach out to me, 
DM me on Instagram and ask me questions, uh, follow me. I'd be happy and I'd be happy to engage in the conversations because I think it's important to have a artist community. 100%. Oh, thank you so much, Gina. And you guys definitely check out Gina's work and we will also have that information in the show notes. So Gina, thank you again. We will meet someday. It'll happen somehow. Art world's small yes. and um, just have a really great day. You too. Thank you so much, Erica. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.